Starting off with number 10, the journal. According to royal biographer Omid Scobie, Meghan Markle's aides were terrified of what she might say after only one podcast episode was released. However, following her in-depth cover interview with The Cut, new concerns have been raised regarding the Duchess of Sussex's potential speech and the royal family's impact. The journal she kept while working as a royal, which she told The Cut she found when she returned to the UK for the Jubilee, is a particular point of contention. Although Meghan didn't say anything else about the journal or its contents, it probably talks about her negative time with the royals in England. When it comes to the royals, it appears that there is already some concern regarding the existence of this journal and the possibility that it will be published. According to a source who spoke with The Sun, Harry and Meghan were told to ignore newspapers and social media, but sometimes staff would say to them, so sorry about what was written the other day, and she would hit the roof. As a form of protection, she recorded everything in a diary. It would undoubtedly be a dynamite weapon if it ever came into existence. This journal appears to have been rediscovered this summer, packed and shipped back to Montecito. The revelation that Meghan rediscovered what she was writing in her journal at Frogmore Cottage must trigger warning signals to the royal family, a royal expert and author Margaret Holder told the outlet. She went on to say that the Duchess had enough time in the royal fold to learn secrets, some of which were decades old, which could cause the monarch and the family embarrassment and heartache, but could earn a fortune for Meghan. We'll see what happens, I guess. Number 9 Criticized by Friends Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have been criticized for disclosing secrets about the Hollywood elite. Kinsey Sheffield, a royal expert, reveals that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex are overwhelming their celebrity friends with too much information. She told Fox News the recent Netflix documentary Spare and Harry and Meghan's relationships with the Hollywood elite will most likely suffer. Did Beyonce, who is extremely private, allow Meghan to read a text message that she sent the Duchess in its entirety to millions of Netflix subscribers? I very much doubt it. After Gail King claimed that her friends, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, had receipts, does Gail King enjoy being grilled by the internet when Harry tells ITV there isn't a royal racist? They are putting individuals in perilous circumstances. She made the observation that most people don't want to pick a side and would prefer to avoid the drama. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think the couple discussed sharing private matters involving their friends beforehand? Number 8. Drama with Kate Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle were unlikely soulmates due to their diverse experiences and backgrounds. Bauer claims that Kate was troubled when she arrived with Charlotte, her three-year-old daughter, at a fitting for the bridesmaids' dresses, which was accompanied by tension. The two disagreed about whether the bridesmaids ought to wear tights to the wedding. Kate thought they should adhere to the protocol, but the Californian did not care about royal custom. By that time, complaints that Meghan was bullying her staff had also irritated Kate. The disagreement that followed was about how long Charlotte's hem was. Kate didn't fit in anyway because she thought it was too short. This got worse when Meghan's assistant, Melissa Tubati, and Claire Wake Keller of Givenchy's Dress Fitters saw Meghan strongly reject Kate's observation. Kate burst into tears when she realized that the standoffs proved the claims made about Meghan by Tubati and other staff members. The story does not end here. Kate made the decision to make amends after leaving that unhappy scene. She carried Meghan a bouquet of flowers across the corridor at Kensington Palace. Additionally, Kate advised Meghan not to be impolite to her staff. You'll never guess what allegedly happened next. Meghan, according to Kate, threw the flowers into a trash can and slammed the door in her face. Meghan would tell Oprah Winfrey that Kate was not the one who wept and that the flowers were her way of apologizing. Meghan correctly stated, I think that's where everything changed. Sounds like some intense things happen behind the palace doors. Number 7, Meghan's Way. Bauer goes into great detail about Harry and Meghan's marriage, citing a number of instances in which Harry tried to meet Meghan's demands in a way that went against the rules of the royal family. Harry asked the Queen for permission to leave Nottingham Cottage and establish their lives outside of Buckingham Palace a few months after the wedding. The Queen agreed that the Frogmore Cottages on the Windsor Estate should be given to the couple in order to accommodate her grandson. Although it was hard to believe that Meghan wanted to live 25 miles 
miles from London, and within the flight path of Heathrow, builders were hired to quickly transform the five decaying units into a luxurious five bedroom home. The way the line was drawn is also mentioned in the audiobook, but Harry's demands were still met. He was informed that he would be assigned a small office inside Buckingham Palace on the Queen's orders and would work under her supervision. Harry was left out while William ran his own business, and Charles was in favor of the choice. Number 6. The Secret Mic On September 10, following the passing of Queen Elizabeth, keen-eyed viewers claimed to have observed Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, speaking to mourners outside Windsor Castle wearing a covert device. On Twitter, a picture of the Duchess appeared to show her with a rectangular object concealed beneath her black dress. The object in question can be seen in the original photo, and it has been confirmed that the picture was taken by Chris Jackson. If Meghan and Harry were filming footage for a documentary, they would need some kind of microphone. These days, microphones are wireless and frequently concealable. Therefore, it is not out of the question that the duo might be sporting them. Do you think Meg would be bold enough to wear a mic at a funeral though? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Number 5. Breaking Protocols In November of last year, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle went outside for a photo call at Kensington Palace. She wore a green dress and a white coat to the big event. Did you notice the item she left off? Insider got the following explanation from royal expert Victoria Arbiter. A royal is never seen without their naked stockings. From what I can see in the engagement photos, Meghan did not appear to be wearing stockings or tights. Meghan wore a bespoke piece by Venezuelan designer Carolina Herrera and arrived at the annual royal event with her husband, Prince Harry, looking every bit the modern day princess. However, the Suits actress, who is now a princess, has already broken one royal dress code, letting her shoulders show. Most of the time, royal women don't wear off the shoulder or other more revealing styles, a departure from the usual British designers that royals like Kate Middleton have chosen for other such high profile occasions. Markle wore a stunning Dior dress to the christening of baby Archie. McQueen has been worn by Middleton to all three of her children's christenings. Markle's wardrobe strategy emphasizes supporting female designers, and she has been a fan of Maria Grazia Churi ever since she was named Dior's creative director. For the royal wedding, Markle wore Essie's ballet slippers, which is the lightest shade of pink or a neutral color. This is not the case here. At the Royal Albert Hall, Markle broke a tradition by painting her nails Bordeaux. Those royals won't wear anything that shows their legs. Stockings are required whenever you wear a skirt or dress, according to protocol. However, Meghan wore a black Judith and Charles tuxedo dress bare leg in the midst of the August heat. Although Meghan has broken the rule before, this is the first time she has done so since becoming a duchess. Meghan Markle wore a Ralph Lauren striped shirt and white pants to the Wimbledon women's finals. Number four, family problems. When they decide to share potentially damaging information about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, not all members of Meghan Markle's family are willing to be identified publicly. Now that Meghan and Prince Harry have decided to live a more private life in the US, they are closer to Meghan's family. However, an unidentified family member told Fox News that Meghan won't be contacting relatives anytime soon to have playdates with their children, Archie and Lilibet. Yes, right after I also scheduled a playdate with Oprah Winfrey's family. The source responded mockingly to the idea. We won't ever talk again because it's obvious that we come from different social classes. The insider also said that Meghan now thinks she is better than her family and that they don't want a relationship with her if it's fake. The source stated, you shouldn't have to be someone you're not or belong to a certain class to be loved and accepted. I am not chasing after a person who is unwilling to speak with me. My own family is the love of my life and we couldn't be happier. A family member stated that Meghan's absence from her family is allegedly her choice. Nevertheless, they wished Harry and Meghan all the best with their growing family. Number 3. Fitting in Before taking a break from her royal duties in January 2020, Meghan Markle breaks down in tears because of how hard she tried to fit in. The former Suits star admits, I tried so hard, in the second half of Harry and Meghan, which was released on Netflix. That's the part that's so triggering because you still don't fit in and it wasn't good enough. In the documentary, Markle talks about leaving England and says that a man in charge of the plane's crew took off his hat and thanked her for everything she did for the country. It was the first time that I felt like someone saw the sacrifice. Not for my own country, but for this country. The Duchess of Sussex recalled, 
It's not my thing. Merkel claims that she fell into the arms of one of Prince Harry's longtime security guards when the couple arrived in Canada. The former star of Deal or No Deal says that she then told the employee of her husband that she tried so hard and he responded by saying, I know you did, ma'am. On to number two, dishonest prince. Senior royals are said to be continuing with their duties and are not publicly reacting to the show. After using the show to criticize Meghan's father, Thomas Markle, for making deals with photographers, Harry has also come under fire for being accused of being dishonest. Netflix was informed by the shameless prince, amazing things can happen when a lot of money is offered to people. It is said that he and Meghan were paid 80 million pounds to talk about their personal lives on the show. Amazing things can happen when you're offered a lot of money, right Harry? After making at least 17 errors during their Oprah Winfrey interview, the couple has a history of struggling to tell the truth. Even though she had denied the claims for years, Meghan had to apologize to the High Court for forgetting she had briefed the authors of Finding Freedom. Their spokesperson claimed that Megxit was never about privacy, which caused a stir. The New York Times quoted Ashley Hansen as saying their statement announcing their decision to step back makes no mention of privacy and reaffirms their desire to continue their public roles and responsibilities. Any suggestion to the contrary refers to a crucial aspect of the series. While the tabloid media has constructed an entirely false narrative that permeates media coverage and public opinion, they have made the decision to share their story on their terms. They have the facts at their fingertips. And number one, the failed curtsy moment. One very spoken about scene in the Harry and Meghan docuseries that also sparked a lot of heated debate stood out for many viewers. When the ex-royal Meghan demonstrated her curtsy during her first encounter with the Queen. The Duchess of Sussex talks about getting ready to meet the late Queen Elizabeth for the first time in the video. In the second episode of their six part Netflix series, Meghan and Prince Harry gave a joint interview where she claimed she didn't know they were going to meet her until moments before. When Harry asked to Meg to make sure she knew how to curtsy, she thought he was lying. The Duchess recalled quickly learning how to curtsy prior to her first encounter with the monarch. Americans would comprehend this. I mean, she also compared the experience to the American dinner theater production, Medieval Times Dinner and Tournament, which features jousting and sword fighting as medieval inspired activities. The Duchess then stood and said, pleasure to meet you, your majesty, with a wide smile in a moment that divided viewers. She did this in an effort to show how she had curtsied before Queen Elizabeth in a very over-exaggerated way that rubbed a lot of viewers the wrong way. Number 10, turns out the royals aren't much different than us when it comes to wanting to treat the inner child. As King Charles is well into the 70s, it might be a surprise to some to find out that the king keeps a teddy bear with him, taking it everywhere he goes. There have been many stories about King Charles and his teddy bear. It was a pitiful object, Harry says in his book about his father's prized possession with broken arms and dangly threads, holes patched up here and there, Teddy expressed eloquently, better than Pa ever could, the essential loneliness of his childhood. The king has had it in his possession since he was a young boy and apparently values it so much that he assigned a valet to oversee its well-being when he was in his 40s. When the well-worn stuffed animal was in need of mending, the now king's former nanny was allegedly asked to come out of retirement to fix the old bear. It seems like every time that Teddy needed to be repaired, you would think it was his own child having major surgery. Harry also jokes that he and his brother accepted their stepmother because their dad deserved better than the plush toy. Apologies to Teddy, Pa deserved a proper companion. That was why when asked, Willie and I promised Pa that we'd welcome Camilla into the family. Number 9, is King Charles secretly an acrobat too? According to Harry, when he was a young boy, his father would do a headstand every morning alone in his room, wearing only boxer shorts. He would also hang like a skilled acrobat from a bar. I wonder if Camilla joins him in doing this too or if she just walks by like it's completely normal for the king to be upside down on his head in boxers. I gotta admit that is pretty impressive for someone as old as him, but it's also pretty funny to hear that at any given moment if you walk into his room in the mornings, there's a chance you might catch him doing a headstand with nothing but boxer shorts on. I think every time I'll see a pic of Charles, that'll be the only thing I'll think of now. Did someone walk in on him doing a headstand today? It's definitely 
definitely not the worst thing to catch someone doing in their bedroom, but as a king, seeing him upside down would definitely crack me up. Number eight, according to Harry, his father must have been a bloodhound in a former life. He was always sniffing things, food, roses, our hair, he writes. He adds that he took all these long sniffs because it was hard to smell anything over his personal scent. Oh, sauvage. He'd slather the stuff on his cheeks, his neck, his shirt, flowery with a hint of something harsh like pepper or gunpowder. It was made in Paris. I bet Camilla makes sure she smells extra good every day just in case Charles wants to go ahead and sniff her. As a king, that has got to be the funniest things to do. Why are you going around and sniffing random things? At least Charles is making the most use out of his nose. If you're able to smell things, why not smell everything, right? I totally understand the logic, Charles. And considering his very strong cologne, I can only imagine how much Charles wants to be able to smell other things outside of himself. Number seven, King Charles is particular about how he likes his women presented. This was one of the reasons Harry asked Meghan to wear her hair down when they met for the first time. Her hair was down because I suggested she wear it that way. Paul likes it when women wear their hair down. Granny too. She often commented on Kate's beautiful mane. That's a fun fact for you guys. The royals like when you let down your hair. Also, Meg was wearing little makeup, which I'd also suggested, Harry continues. Pa didn't approve of women who wore a lot. And although the amount of makeup you wear is your own personal choice, I guess now you know if you ever want to flatter the King of England, make sure you present yourself naturally. Makes sense why Camilla is mostly seen with her hair down. Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think I've ever seen the Queen concert with her hair up. Number six, Harry claims that his father falls asleep on the job. He and his brother would find him at his desk amid mountains of bulging post bags. More than once, we discovered him face on the desk, fast asleep. We'd shake his shoulders and up he'd bob, a piece of paper stuck to his forehead. But considering his age, it might not be as much of a surprise that the king generally is more into relaxing than doing the royal work. At 73, most people his age are retiring and relaxing at their villas in Florida, but Charles is just starting a more intense chapter in the monarchy, which was also a reason people didn't think Charles would be fit to be king in old age. But what do you guys think? Personally, that's the most I've ever related to the king. I too am always tired and longing to take a nap no matter what time of day it is. Matter of fact, might even snooze a little after this video. Number five, while it is common knowledge that royals aren't that into PDA, according to Prince Harry, his father didn't even hug him when he told him about the tragic accident that Princess Diana was involved in. This could be because Charles is just not used to showing it. I mean, have we ever seen any sort of PDA between Camilla and Charles? Or maybe Charles just doesn't know how to display physical affection. And in a situation as intense as telling his son his mother has passed on, he may have felt awkward or had no idea how to console Harry. What do you think? His other son William and daughter-in-law Kate have also rarely shown PDA as seen in pics of the couple. We can see where Will has gotten that trait from. The late Queen Elizabeth also refrained from showing PDA and wanted her family to also refrain from doing so, especially on business trips because it seemed unprofessional. Harry and Meg have casually bent this rule many times throughout their time as working royals, but considering they ended up stepping back, it's clear they didn't care much about a lot of the things done within the palace anyway. Number four, even though many might see the story of the Little Mermaid as a fairy tale, King Charles believes there might be some truth to the tale. According to Harry, Charles had once told him and Meg a story about Selkies, aka Scottish mermaids, who took the form of seals. So when you see a seal, he said, you can never tell. Sing to it. They often sing back. When Harry accused him of telling fairy tales, Charles responded, no, it's absolutely true. As convincing as the story is, we wonder if he's convinced Camilla or if she thinks he's deluded for believing in the mystical creatures. Other odd things to know about the king is that he has a number of highly specific must-haves on his travel packing list, including a custom toilet seat that accompanies him anytime he stays away from home. The claims of its existence are backed up by Tina Brown, who also mentioned it in her book, The Palace Papers, released in April of this year. Brown also listed an orthopedic bed, a pair of Scottish landscape paintings, and Charles's favorite brand of toilet paper, Kleenex Velvet, among the items that are prepared to meet the monarch at his travel destinations. 
As you'd expect from a king, Charles takes his breakfast experience very seriously. Here's a very detailed description of what to expect if you're eating with Charles. The king's breakfast tray always contains a cup and saucer to the right, with a silver spoon pointing outward at an angle of 5 o'clock. Butter must come in three balls and be chilled. The royal toast is always on a silver rack, never on a plate. Assorted jams, jellies, marmalades, and honey are served on a separate silver tray. The former prince is known to skip lunch but had similar expectations at dinner, which he usually eats, accompanied by a side salad and a soft boiled egg, likely from one of his own chickens. Chefs in the royal kitchen normally prepared several three minute eggs before being satisfied that one had been cooked to meet the prince's standards of softness, Anderson alleges in The King. The rejects were discarded. What a waste of eggs, but as we said, the food experience seems to be very personal and serious for the king. Number 3 If you've ever wondered how Charles has remained as fit as he is all these years, the answer is his passion for hiking in the highland. There are many benefits to walking including helping to maintain a healthy weight, strengthening the bones and muscles, and improving muscle endurance. This simple exercise can prevent or manage health conditions such as heart disease, stroke, cancer and type 2 diabetes, so get into it. Let's stay fit, guys. Camilla spoke about her husband's love of walking on BBC Radio 5's The Emma Barnett Show in June 2020, saying of Charles, he is probably the fittest man of his age I know. Divulging some of her husband's biggest secrets, Camilla continued, he'll walk and walk and walk, he's like a mountain goat, he leaves everybody miles behind. Charles has been open about his love of gardening and nature throughout his life. I can't blame him. Surrounding yourself in nature is a peaceful and amazing experience. I just come and talk to the plants, really. Very important to talk to them. They respond, I find, the then prince said in a 1986 interview. Charles also recently praised his youngest son Prince Harry's efforts on climate change awareness and his charity Archwell's commitment to being net zero. Charles has now taken on a role previously held by his father Prince Philip and is now the ranger of Windsor Great Park, one of England's oldest land estates. Number 2 Charles was the first royal heir apparent to be educated outside of the palace. The young prince attended Hill House School in London, where he even interacted with other students. He later transferred to a boarding school that his father Prince Philip had attended. If you think bullies don't go after the royals, you're wrong. Charles was said to have experienced this during his childhood at his school. He would be made fun of for his ears that stick out quite a bit, as well as his weight. Well, I guess we know now that no matter how much money or power you have, there will always be haters. Sensitive and not particularly gifted athletically, Charles preferred his own company and loved to paint and draw. According to Vanity Fair, Charles was homesick during his time away at school and sent letters home on a weekly basis. I'd be homesick too if I had to move away from my huge palace just to get bullied. I get it, Charles. Number one, a lot of Charles and Diana's first conversations took place over the phone. Less than a year after the couple began dating, and after only 13 in person meetings, then Prince Charles and Lady Diana announced their engagement. The prince was clearly in a rush to wed since he was 32 at the time he did end up marrying this 19 year old Diana. But we need to circle back to the 13 in person meetings. No wonder their marriage ended in shambles. They did not know enough about each other. Diana and Charles even wanted to call off the wedding. On July 29, 1981, Charles and Diana were married in a spectacular televised ceremony. It was then called the Wedding of the Century. Roughly 750 million people in 74 different countries tuned in to watch the couple tie the knot in addition to the 600,000 spectators who lined the streets of London. When it came to Camilla, they obviously had spoken on the phone and met in person much more than with Diana. Considering they were still having an affair during his marriage with Diana, it's clear that he's always had a special spot for Camilla. And even though he initially did not have the approval of the throne to marry her, they did eventually get married in 2005. Considering everything we know so far about the king, I wonder what else there is that he's still hiding, and I wonder if Camilla knows some of these things, because honestly, like standing on your head in your boxers is kind of odd, but he makes it work, I guess, since he's a king. I wonder what else is going down in Buckingham Palace that we still don't know about. But we also know that a lot of the things they do like to keep behind the closed doors of the palace. 
Number 10, Suspicions. On July 29th, 1981, 750 million people in more than 70 countries watched then Prince Charles marry Lady Diana Spencer at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Although the marriage ended in divorce in 1996 and Diana tragically lost her life in a car accident a year later, their wedding remains one of the most iconic moments in royal history. The celebration set the scene for future royal weddings, including those of Prince William. William and Catherine Middleton in 2011, and Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in 2018. But let's not skim over the fact that just because they had a dreamy wedding, their relationship was the same way. As we all know, it was revealed soon enough that they were having troubles in their marriage. One of the many troubles being to stay faithful to each other. The extramarital affairs were the biggest giveaway that this marriage was not a happy one for either King Charles or Princess Diana. According to Diana, her true story by Andrew Morton, the young princess had strong suspicions of her husband's relationship with Camilla from the time they were engaged and she bought her former lover a piece of jewelry customized with an inside joke. Red flag. However, those close to the princess denied the affair, causing her to question her own sanity. The queen mother even told her friends Diana was a silly girl for imagining such things. Despite this, Diana pressed on with her belief and even confronted Camilla about the affair. Number 9. Finding Out Diana's suspicions about Charles' affair were indeed correct. And in fact, some of the people denying her claims were the very people trying to hide the relationship from her. These people were really gaslighting the Princess of Wales so much to the point that Diana was convinced she was going crazy. Shakespeare couldn't even write a tragedy like this. According to a new foreword in Morton's book, Charles asked his staff's assistants to cover up his affair with Camilla. Charles' bodyguard was forced to accompany the prince on illicit nighttime visits to see Camilla, while his chef and butler were instructed to cook dinner, even though they knew Charles would be out with his lover. Charles' valet was instructed to mark up the TV listings guide to make it look like the prince had spent the night at home watching television. When Charles broke his arm in a polo accident, his staff was responsible for listening to police radios to track Diana's journey to the hospital, so they could get Camilla out of Charles' room before the princess arrived. Charles really had his staff working overtime to protect his lies from Diana, but the whole time she already knew. Charles' staff was sickened by the deception, according to Morton, and predicted the imploding of the marriage. In 1994, the secret came out when Charles admitted to the affair publicly, two years after he and Diana had officially separated. The couple finally divorced in 1996, and Charles went on to marry Camilla in 2005. Are we shocked, folks? Charles finally ties knot with former mistress, who had also become the most hated woman in the UK, because people blamed her for the failure of Diana and Charles' marriage. I'm not saying I'm taking any sides, but I think Charles himself should be the one to blame for the failure of their marriage. What do you guys think? Number 8. Uncertainties They'd seen each other just 13 times before the proposal. Diana later told her biographer Andrew Morton that she responded with giggles as she thought he was joking, but the prince was deadly serious, emphasizing the earnestness of his proposal by reminding her that one day she would be queen. But this sudden engagement may have been a mistake. I mean, you don't just do that. Both Charles and Diana had second thoughts about their engagement. Charles was concerned about Diana's mood swings and, according to journalist Tina Brown, was desperately worried about how thin she was getting. Charles's biographer Sally Bedell Smith notes he ultimately put it down to pre-wedding jitters. Diana, on the other hand, was troubled by Charles's enduring friendship with his former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles. And on top of that, Diana was suffering with major depression and eating disorders due to Charles pointing out that her wrists looked chubby. Pro tip, don't ever comment on someone's body if you don't want to be disrespected. Number 7. Problematic Wedding Guest 3,500 people were on the guest list, including political figures from around the world. Charles was Queen Elizabeth II's oldest son and the heir to the throne. Therefore, the guest list included obligatory world leaders as well as friends and family. And as savage as it may be for Charles to do this, Camilla Parker Bowles was one of the guests. Camilla wore a gray suit and matching pillbox hat with a veil, and was seated next to her sister, Annabelle Elliott. Her first husband, Andrew Parker Bowles, was part of the festivities, commanding the household cavalry escort for the newlywed Charles and Diana. The audacity to show up to the wedding as the groom's mistress. 
the story just writes itself. And to add to the fire, Charles even wore cufflinks to his wedding, which were Camilla's gift to him. It can't get better than this, folks. Just in case you were wondering why Charles never married Camilla in the first place, the royals did not approve of her since she had previously been married, which was frowned upon, especially for the future king of the country. But fast forward to 05, Charles finally got his way and married Camilla, who is now queen consort. I guess this couple was meant to be. Number six. When Princess Diana passed away in 1997, her box of secrets, containing 10 never before seen videotapes and audio cassettes she secretly recorded, disappeared from Kensington Palace and have never been recovered. Suspicious, right? Like, in Diana Case Solved, authors Dylan Howard and former detective Colin McLaren claim the lost tapes contained a record of her knowledge of scandals that could finish Britain's monarchy, and that she stashed them in a box called the Crown Jewels. They were kept under lock and key in her Kensington Palace apartment, along with a signet ring belonging to her former lover, James Hewitt, and photographs that show her ex-husband, Prince Charles, part of a compromising picture involving a male lover, their informants claim. Diana definitely knew some things that could have gotten her in trouble for exposing. As always, the royalty is always steaming hot. <sighs> Ooh. Number five, Diana famously recorded 16 videos with her voice coach, Peter Settelin, in 1993 just months after her separation from Charles. Six of them were used for a controversial documentary that aired in Britain two years ago, but the remaining 10 have never been seen. What worried the royal family more is that, according to a new investigation into her passing away, she also recorded 12 tapes detailing her most intimate secrets. The royal family was said to be petrified, Paul would reveal, the allegations squirreled away on tape recordings, the authors claim. The royals knew she had been collecting information on them for years and wanted her out of the way. They couldn't have had their trail of affairs and CD secrets coming out in the open. The secret stash of recordings and photographs were among the items Paul took to the attic of his home after Diana's passing, which is why the police raided his home on January 18th, 2001, and also the reason his theft trial was aborted at the last minute. As everyone knows, the Queen herself stepped in at the 11th hour to state she had suddenly recalled giving Burrell permission to take keepsakes from Diana's apartment, something Burrell had claimed all along, the book says. It was only an intervention of this magnitude that could stop the world hearing the butler reveal exactly what was among the items he had lifted. Paul was later summoned to a three-hour meeting with the Queen, during which he says she chillingly told him that his life may be in danger from knowing too much about the royal family. Number four, Diana's hostility towards Charles is not spared by Bedell Smith. She hated all of his hobbies, his polo, his paintings, his gardening, even his love of Shakespeare, according to the author. Diana taunted him by saying, you'll never be king, and banished many of his old friends, including the Romseys, the Palmer Tompkinsons, and the Tory MP, Nicholas Soames. Resenting anything associated with Charles's previous life, she also insisted on getting rid of Harvey, his yellow Labrador, who was sent to live with one of the prince's advisors. Eventually, the couple took separate bedrooms. At Highgrove, Bedell Smith writes, that entailed Charles moving into a dressing room to sleep on a single bed, along with a well-worn teddy bear. As a last attempt to facilitate reconciliation, the royal family sent in the Archbishop of Canterbury, but according to the author, he saw little evidence that Diana was prepared to make the marriage work, and concluded with some sorrow that Charles was more sinned against than sinning. When the Queen finally advised a separation, Bedell Smith says everyone in Charles's family took his side, including Princess Margaret, who had previously shown kindness, even tenderness, to Diana. Prince Philip sent his son a long letter praising his saint-like fortitude. In separation, their relationship apparently mellowed, with Charles sometimes dropping in to see her and consulting her about their sons. But as Bedell Smith writes, when Charles heard the news about Diana's accident while being driven through a Paris tunnel with Dodie, he was distraught. At 7.15 in the morning, when his sons awoke, he told them what had happened. Later, lashed with grief, self-pity, and regret, the prince turned to his courtiers and wondered if people were going to blame him. The drama was always there with this couple, and it was only a matter of time before it became explosive. Number three, the seemingly storybook romance turned out to be a nightmare, but one author claims things were much darker behind closed doors. Christopher Anderson has written a new book about Queen Elizabeth II's eldest son titled The King, 
the life of Charles III. He spoke to numerous palace insiders, as well as those who've known the former Prince of Wales or worked with him closely over the years. His goal was to further investigate the 74-year-old's lonely childhood and military training, as well as several scandals surrounding his relationship that rocked the House of Windsor. The marriage between Charles and Diana became so volatile that royal protection officers were wary of all the weapons scattered around the palace. He has a huge temper, Anderson claimed about the king. I mean, it's an incredible temper. The tantrums constantly and throwing a boot jack at her. It's a heavy wooden device for putting on hunting boots and it's made of iron and wood. He threw it at Diana's head and just missed her. It was Charles' former valet, Ken Stronach, who alleged to Anderson that he was in the room when Charles, in the middle of an argument with Diana, grabbed a heavy wooden boot jack and threw it at her, missing the princess's head by inches, as quoted in the book. The relationship was so toxic from the beginning, the fact that it lasted 15 years is pretty sad to know. They both deserved better than that. Anderson wrote that during the marriage, Charles had sunk into a deep depression and thought he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He turned to one of his confidants, Arnold Goodman, and allegedly said, I have nothing to live for. Goodman allegedly felt that Charles was showing the classic signs of depression. Charles not only believed he was trapped in a loveless marriage, but he feared that a divorce, if it could even be granted by the queen, would have grave repercussions for his children, the royal family, and the monarchy itself. Number two, during his affair with Camilla, Charles shut down emotionally toward Diana, and no one's really been there to defend her. In 1992, Andrew Morton wrote Diana her true story, a shocking tell-all about the collapsing marriage. It also detailed Charles' relationship with Camilla, as well as Diana's mental health struggles. At the time, it wasn't confirmed that the princess secretly collaborated with the British author on the book. That same year, it was announced that the couple was separating. The divorce was finalized in 1996. A year later, Diana passed away from injuries she sustained in the Paris car crash at age 36. Anderson said Charles was devastated by Diana's passing. When he received the dreaded call, he allegedly clutched the telephone ashen and trembling. He then let out a cry of pain that was so spontaneous and came from the heart. One witness described it as a howl of anguish that was heard down the hall. Palace staff rushed over to Charles' room and found him collapsed in the armchair weeping uncontrollably. Charles is responsible not only for having brought the monarchy to its knees at one point after Diana passed away, but also rescuing it, Anderson explained. I don't think people realize how really stricken he was by her passing. I interviewed the nurses in the hospital who saw him when he first came into the room and saw her body for the first time. And he looked like he'd been hit in the face. He reeled back. They thought he was going to faint. They were surprised to see how emotional Charles was after her passing. Number one, this explosive marriage may have come to an end with Charles leading a very different life, with former flame and queen consort Camilla. But the relationship he has with his kids, especially after Diana had passed away, is another tragedy. Harry even moved out of the palace, claiming that that's the life his mother would have wanted for him. Both sons did not want Charles to marry Camilla. So when Charles did not consider his son's wishes, their relationship soured a bit. Seems for Charles that even as a king, it's impossible to have everything you want. Starting off with number 10, now that King Charles is living a king-sized life, how can we pretend there aren't any regal secrets he's keeping from us? After inheriting the properties from his mother, Queen Liz, Charles has been getting a lot more attention, and obviously we're gonna dig into the English wealth and their secrets. For a regular British citizen, an inheritance over $380,000 is taxed 40%. But King Charles doesn't have to pay anything on properties, jewels, and investments that probably are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Whatever happened to eating the rich? The royal treatment is getting out of hand. Having all this money and privilege on top of not having to pay taxes? Every day this family makes me wonder why I wasn't born a royal. But anyway, according to the British government, the monarchy needs sufficient private resources and a degree of financial independence from the government. Am I the only one who feels like the British government is sucking up to the royals? Or is everyone in the UK in some trance? Because considering their extremely problematic history, how are they getting away with all of this? It has to be a trance, right? Maybe that's what they're hiding from us. They might not even be royal. Maybe they just set up a whole castle and trance the whole country just so they don't have to pay taxes. Honestly, I might be onto something. The same document explains that the British Crown is also not legally liable for income tax or capital gains tax. Personally, I think the British people should overthrow the throne at this point because taxes should not be reserved for regular citizens. But that's just me. Or what if they flipped and only taxed the extremely rich people? That is the society I would love to live in. 
On to number 9, the royal family is under few requirements to disclose details of its wealth, but all I'm gonna say is, if you want to find out, it's not too difficult to go all Sherlock Holmes on the family. The family's communications with the government are exempt from freedom of information requests. Their official papers are kept secret by Britain's National Archives for at least 50 years. The lack of transparency has led anti-monarchy groups, including the Republic, to call the monarchy an unaccountable public institution that has the power, secrecy, and influence to willfully abuse its position. What do you guys think about that? Do you think they're abusing their position? Because I kind of agree. Without a change, many details of the royal family's private wealth may never be known. Facts about the Duchy of Lancaster's offshore investments were leaked back in 2017, and those detailed roughly $13 million in offshore accounts. I wonder what else could be revealed if more documents were suddenly leaked. Seriously, we need some investigative work done on this family. Other reports have suggested questionable foreign dealings or arrangements. Earlier this year, King Charles was accused of offering to help secure a knighthood for a Saudi national in response to a donation for his charitable foundation. Representatives of Charles did deny this, but it sounds a little suspicious to me. Counting down to number 8, historically speaking, having a claim to the throne has been a big deal. Wars have been fought over who has the most right to rule, and even if it is less significant to everyday people, the royal family takes this very seriously. If they were not the legitimate heirs to the throne for some reason, then they'd be just regular folks who'd have to find a house to rent somewhere. If only. By and large, no one questions the legitimacy of the royal family, but there has been some potential for disruption thanks to DNA analysis of a body found in a parking lot. After King Richard III was struck down in battle in 1485, his body was laid to rest at Greyfriars Abbey. But a lot can happen in over 500 years, and the abbey, along with the king, were more or less forgotten. So much that his grave ended up being under an office building parking lot. Other bodies have been discovered over the years on the property, and it was known to have once been the site of the abbey. During a DNA analysis to confirm his identity, it turned out to be Richard. But listen to this plot twist. The Y chromosomes in the DNA analysis don't match others in the royal line. Gasp. Who is the imposter? So, quick biology lesson for you guys to help break this down. The maternal line was used to identify the remains of Richard, but if the Y chromosome passed down from the male side doesn't match, it means somewhere in the family line there may have been an affair. Someone at some time gave birth to a child not of the royal line, or pretended the child was legit. This is the real English tea of the day. Drop in the comments who you think the imposter child was, because theories could get interesting. Since we can't know when this affair may have occurred, there's no way to know when it affected the family line. So maybe the current royals are the real deal, or maybe they aren't. Down to seven, ever so often the ruling class get compared to vampires for their habit of living off the people over whom they rule. So there were likely a few critics of the royal family, and King Charles in particular, who would be delighted to discover that the king is literally related to Dracula. Spooky. If Hotel Transylvania makes a new movie, I know who they can incorporate into the plot. Or even better, have as a voice actor for a new character. Matter of fact, I should pitch this idea to Sony ASAP. In real life, Bram Stoker is believed to have based his famous vampire in part on Vlad Tepes, in the 15th century Romanian prince. Vlad earned himself the nickname Impaler due to his penchant for sticking enemies on sharp poles. So the story goes. Fast forward to the present and King Charles is a distant relative of the Romanian prince. He's Dracula's great-grandson 16 times removed. Prince Charles was apparently very stoked to learn this and has a soft spot for Transylvania, the region made famous by Dracula. So now I'm gonna have to go explore my family tree to see if I'm related to any historic or iconic people. On to number six, speaking of crazy conspiracies, word on the street is Jack the Ripper, one of history's most notorious assassins, may have been a royal. His identity was never determined, and even to this day, over a century later, people are trying to piece it together. Back in the day, one potential suspect was Prince Albert Victor. What is going on with this family? First Dracula, now Jack the Ripper. This royal family has some explaining to do because it is just getting out of hand. They cannot keep getting away with it. Another theory was that the British royal family wanted specific women taken out because they knew the prince had an illegitimate son. 
that is some tea. Neither of these theories had any evidence to support it, and they appeared nearly a century after the fact. The result is that it's almost entirely unlikely, but still something the royal family is not likely to ever openly address, and would rather keep on the down low. Let me know if you think this theory is valid. I mean, the possibilities are endless, right? Down to number five, celebrities really do the weirdest things ever and we just accept it because, well, they're celebrities. But traveling with your own bag of blood is just a different level of weird. Even though the reasoning is not the craziest, you have to admit adding a bag of blood to your travel checklist is just so bloody interesting. In case of emergencies, King Charles and Prince William travel with a sack of their own blood on hand. The royals travel with their physician and a bag of their own home brew in case of an emergency transfusion. But hey, I can't blame them. For a good portion of her busier years, the queen was making about one state visit per year, but Prince William was a bit more widely traveled. Blood only has a shelf life of about 42 days after it's been bagged up, so they were probably getting fresh stuff for each and every trip. That's a lot of needlework. I wonder what they would have done if someone had a serious fear of needles. Number four on our countdown, in 1837, the historic Buckingham Palace became the official residence of the British sovereigns in London. This 700 room palace also serves as the venue for many royal events and ceremonies. I would expect them to throw events at a literal palace, so this isn't too shocking, but I wonder how many secret doorways they have, and do any lead to Narnia because that might just be the next thing I do when I ever go to London. Sneak my way into every corridor to find out where the secret passages would be. Who's coming with me? The palace has 19 state rooms, 52 royal and guest bedrooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 92 offices, and 78 bathrooms. It also has a cinema, indoor swimming pool, post office, chapel, a doctor's surgery, and even a cash machine. Having a literal post office in your house is just a next level flex. Maintaining a palace of this size obviously requires a lot of time, money, and staff. With more than 800 workers employed, there's a job for everything in this house. Among the more unusual jobs, there are two full-time clockmakers. The palace has more than 350 clocks, so if you ever need to know the time, you will have a clock somewhere in the vicinity. What a relief. Number three on our list, can we talk about King Charles's privilege? Being a rich white man is one thing, but add royal into the mix and he really is set for life. Becoming king after the late Queen Liz's impressive 70 year reign is definitely a privilege and King Charles is very careful about what about this lifestyle he chooses to show with us regular folk and what is kept behind closed doors. There's one place that his majesty can likely be found, on his hands and knees in his personal Highgrove house gardens. The garden at Highgrove really does spring from my heart and, strange as it may seem to some, creating it has been rather like a form of worship, the royal said in 1993. On to number two, what's the point of all this wealth if you can't share it with your future generations? Nothing is more magical to a young child than a secret treehouse. Originally built for Princes William and Harry, Charles recently renovated the area for the newest generation of the little royal youngsters. The rustic playhouse is in a woodland area known as Stumpery, surrounded by toadstools and stone steps leading up to the playhouse entrance. This sounds like a fairy tale and I'm going to need to schedule a play date so I can go explore this cute treehouse. House. So who's coming with me? Last on the list, there's one question that many have wondered. Do the royals cost the government money or do they make it money? For one, the royals draw tourist dollars as well as publicity for Britain. In 2017, it was estimated that the monarchy boosted the tourism sector by more than $640 million. While the sovereign grant has been growing, which means more money for the royals, the crown estate provides a huge sum of money to the government. Anti-monarchy groups don't really think the royal family brings in money. These groups might be onto something since they suspect that the monarchy actually costs the country about $400 million a year. Apparently it costs the government over $100 million annually to protect the royal family. Word on the street is that King Charles is trying to slim down the monarchy with fewer senior royals. He also talked about opening up more royal properties to the public, a move that could theoretically bring in more revenue. I can't see how this might be a smart business move, but I still do think the anti-monarchy groups might be onto something. 